So it's another beautiful day in the Illawarra region. Now the rest of the pilots in the formation are Central Flying School pilots, so we're all based down in East Sail, Victoria. And uh, Typhoon 2, 3 and 4 are actually future roulettes, so they're about to go through four months of training where they'll start doing low-level aerobatics, formation aerobatics, then low-level formation aerobatics, and then eventually we'll have a six aircraft display. Now, ladies and gentlemen, get your cameras ready for this very special fly past. Now, it's an additional feature we haven't had in previous air shows, but we'll think everyone will agree it makes a great photo. Now, differences with the PC-21 from the PC-9, it is a much more powerful aircraft, so you're looking at a 1,600 horsepower engine uh, in the front of it, and it's actually offset by four degrees, so if you get a chance to look at the static aircraft, the propeller, it nearly looks like it has a broken nose, but that's to uh, offset the torque effect of the aircraft. You see those bright lights on the edges of the wings? They're actually LED lights. Now the PC-21 has lots of special computers and autopilots, but to actually fly in this close formation, it's all hand-eye coordination and pilot skill. And whilst it's easy in straight and level flight, here at Central Flying School, we like to make it difficult by doing 4G turns. And uh, in the future, we'll be doing a full aerobatic show in this tight formation. the brilliant sound of those five-bladed props. Now these aircraft are not only flown by Central Flying School, but they're also a device. Now uh, decoded from acronyms, that actually means it, means it has an auto rudder. So unlike most propeller aircraft where you have to fight around with the rudder, and especially on the PC-9, you had to use a lot of rudder, the PC-21 has an auto runner, which makes it a lot easier to fly. Now Darren will be showing off the full aerobatic capabilities of the aircraft. It can pull up to 8G at negative 4. It also has a run rate of over 200 degrees per second. It's got hydraulically assisted ailerons and rudder and actually has roll spoilers on each wing, so when you apply more than half stick deflection, the roll spoiler raises and gives you the uh, quick roll rate you see there. You see it's got a flat wing with sweep back and it also has winglets. Gives everyone a good look here as he comes past for a slow roll. Now all the manoeuvres being flown today by the pilots are actually manoeuvres you learn on pilot's course. The only difference is we don't let student pilots do them this low on air shows. We come past it 500 feet here for an inverted pass. This is the manoeuvre where you find out if your straps were done up tight enough. You see, hang up in the sky here for a stall turn. This is 
one of the only times he'll touch the rudder on the TC21. In the future, we're going to have smoke pods fitted to the aircraft, so the next time you see the TC21 in the roulette scheme, hopefully it's got smoke tanks fitted. And there are actually two smoke pods per aircraft. And Darren Wong is a former P3 pilot. He was actually telling me yesterday that the, he's actually flown the P3 on display here. And ladies and gentlemen, please thank Flight Lieutenant Darren Wong. Toughly here out there on the aircraft on the right. This is one of the tightest circuits flown. So again, if you're a student pilot, don't ex expect to fly a circuit this tight. And if you'd like to meet the pilots, we'll be uh, down at the signing tent at one o'clock. So you can come and meet us. We've got a whole bunch of merchandise, posters, stickers. And that's just down here below our commentary position, Dan. Just below the commentary position. And we love meeting everyone and ask us lots of questions about the aircraft and life as a pilot in the Air Force. And uh, pitch out hopefully inside the boundaries of the airfield. It makes it harder for the bad guys to be lurking and uh, shooting you if you do a nice long final coming in slow. The last aircraft just coming in now for a short final. And once they have cleared, we actually start a succession of uh, transport aircraft that have been operated by the RAAF. The uh, first two will be... Beautiful sound of those Pratt & Whitney radial engines. I said before, the uh, Americans have very simple designations for uh, their engines. Half a radial. It makes it a lot easier to figure out, doesn't it? Rather than the British, which river is that? Yeah, which river, which bird? Yeah. But um, certainly it does give a description of what's going on. Caribou down there just uh, getting ready. C-47 uh, flown today by Don Hindle. He's a former Royal Canadian Air Force pilot used to fly the uh, C-47 there. You might hear us changing designations on this. C-47 is uh, the designation given to it by the US military, C for cargo. And uh, the DC-3 was actually its civilian name, the Douglas Commercial Model 3. Yeah, the DC-3 was developed from shock horror, the DC-2, but first flew as the Douglas Sleeper Transport and uh, that was actually on the same commemorative date as the Wright Brothers' first flight, December 17th, and for this one, the year 1935. So as the caribou taxis back to uh, take off into wind from the other end, we've got the beautiful DC-3 or C-47 coming in from the right. Over 16,000 of these produced, not only by Doug. Of course, these were the famous biscuit bombers operating up in New Guinea. I have seen that photo. It's quite spectacular to see. But I believe this particular aircraft was recently in a photo shoot for Arju's anniversary. Thousands of uh, civilian operators as well. 
as you said, I think every country in the world has seen DC3 activity, if not had one base there. Can you imagine these things also flying through the narrow valleys that you get in New Zealand, actually uh, dropping fertiliser in those valleys? Yeah, early aerial application. The, um, the New Zealand uh, VIP flight used to be DC-3s and they were all named after wobbles. And the one that took the Queen around New Zealand when she came in was uh, named after, I believe it was Madame Chalet. I actually got to go on that one static when I was a kid back in New Zealand. This will uh, just await Don bringing the aircraft back in now. Haas has uh, quite a number of these uh, these aircraft. Oh, I think we're going to get one more pass. seen all the James Bond movies but uh, Quantum of Solace it has one of the most heartbreaking scenes ever where they uh, supposedly blow one of these up after flying it through a few canyons. It was uh, nice air to air footage but pretty tragic way to lose. A little bit and then take off to the south. That wind is uh, swinging quite a bit now. It certainly is. The anticipated subtly has arrived. Rather than a downwind takeoff, it'll accept the wind. to think the uh, manufacturing effort that went into this used by uh, about 21 different air arms around the world but they only built about 307 it was the fourth aircraft that was designed by de Havilland in Canada of course de Havilland uh, one of the most famous aviation companies uh, in the history of aviation but, uh, de Havilland troops And of course, used by the RW was the uh, last piston-powered aircraft the RAF ever owned. And uh, did a pretty good job in Vietnam where I believe they were known as Wallaby Airlines. Wallaby Airlines, that was, uh, their call sign was Wallaby and uh, the name stuck. We ordered these in 1963 and uh, the first aircraft on their delivery flight to Australia were actually diverted to Vietnam and uh, the transport flight Vietnam, as they were known, then became um, Wallaby Airlines, operated by both 35 and 38 Squadron RAAF. Was 38, I thought 38 Squadron was more operating here in Australia? Yeah, yeah that's and right. 35. 35 was operated up in Vietnam. Okay. I remember, remember seeing one of these uh, was damaged in Vietnam, it was disassembled, came back to Australia, and they actually flew the fuselage up uh, the river to Bankstown for repairs under a Chinook. <laughs> that would have been pretty spectacular. Mars has two of these aircraft, uh, 234 and Serial Notator. They'd go in there, all their livestock, everything they had would be put in the back. Uh, it wasn't unusual to have a, a payload that consisted of pigs in cages, water buffalo and people. You just have to take a lot of care to wash that out because there's nothing quite like animals who are scared to uh, ruin the interior of an air because of its commonality of engines, propellers, cockpit systems and the load capacity, well not capacity but the uh, loading systems in the back that lets it take a, a Hercules pallet. 
This is a, uh, a tactical battlefield airlifter and um, designed to fill the gap. Quite quick, has a fantastic performance. As Grant said, uh, the same engines as the C-130s that we're operating here. Uh, 4,650 shaft horsepower Rolls-Royce turboprops. This, the, the RAF, when they're operating them, spend a lot of time out in the field working with Army. Uh, a number of the Army operators consider it to be effectively a big swing Chinook. So they can take loads out with the Chinook, but from the forward air areas that the C-27 delivers to. Of course, it's also uh, designed to reduce helicopter hour operations. Uh, yeah, no more having to break down pallets into small loads. I'm told you could just take the pallet off the C-130, turn it sideways, roll it straight in. Straight in. Built by Alenia in, uh, in Italy. Certainly has a great performance. Back in 2007, was uh, selected by the US military as their joint cargo aircraft, and uh, L3 Communications came along to uh, coordinate the various suppliers and produce the C-27J for the US. We uh, joined in to buy them. Unfortunately, the US, due to some uh, budgetary issues, uh, suspended their program, but we were still able to get ours by foreign military sale. And uh, many of the US ones are now with their Coast Guard, pretty much a bit major leap, but once they went to the J, they no longer needed the uh, flight engineer, so it's a two-pilot crew and a loadmaster. Yep, the uh, aircraft has been stretched considerably. you think that uh, the Hercules first flew way back in 1954, and they've produced about uh, 2,800 of them to date. A uh, friend of mine was lucky enough to be on board a C-130 during an exercise such as Red Flag. Uh, they were doing low-level tactical deliveries and got bounced by a couple of the Red Fighters who got very surprised when it suddenly disappeared. And very nimble and uh, good performance for something so large. Carry about 128 uh, troops, 92 paratroops, or 97 uh, stretchers. Back in 2008 had a fly away price of about US $60 million. I'm not sure if that came with floppy dice though. This is uh, not the first aircraft to uh, incorporate this rear loading ram. And in fact, that was uh, on the Luftwaffe aircraft in World War II, which was also called the Hercules. Nice touch and go there. Very nice. So the, the more stick input you give it, the more spoilers come out. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, it's, for its size, it's very manoeuvrable and uh, safe by fast standards. Actually has a joystick up the front, not a big control column. It does have a joystick and uh, um, it is quite a joy to fly and uh, it's, um, it's yeah, as you saw, very manoeuvrable and um, we love flying and showing it off. How long have you been flying it for? Uh, I've been on the jet for four years, got about 2,000 hours, um, and uh, just about explored the entire planet, including Antarctica, and uh, it's one of our, uh, our more exciting missions going down there, supporting um, the, uh, the government yeah. down there. Yeah, all well, the science experiments and so on at the, uh, at the at which runways, it's not the Watkins, it's the... Um, yeah, the that's got me there. I should know, we've done the approach and departure plates for it at my day job. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they've had a couple of times when they couldn't land anything down the Antarctic because it was too warm and the runway was actually melting, but 
Yeah, when we went down there, it was minus 14 degrees when we landed and um, minus 2 when we left, so it was actually almost 200. Yeah, but uh, everyone would have been running around in sh short sleeves and shorts. Absolutely, yeah. It was uh, it was quite warm, especially because we have to wear all the special gear. And Wilkins is the runway, my apologies. <laughs> no worries, I led you into that one. At the uh, minus 40 degrees uh, that most people are used to, I've experienced that kind of change. I was living in Boston and during winter we had minus 40 degrees and then one day it was zero degrees. We're outside in a pair of jeans and t-shirts throwing the ball around. Never thought I'd be doing that. And looking great to the right against the escarpment. All rivals. No, definitely not. The, uh, the jet is very maneuverable though, so we can rotate uh, around about 93 knots uh, uh, and, uh, and upwards depending on our weight. Um, and we'll stop in, uh, on a runway that's uh, short as 3,500 feet. That's pretty good for something this big. Absolutely, yeah, it's uh, quite impressive. Because you, you, with, when you're not as heavily loaded, you can do the tactical approaches where you come in quite steep and then just flare right at the last minute. Yeah, definitely, and the, and the jet does that even with uh, weight quite, uh, quite well. Um, reverse thrust is something we can use airborne, just idle. Uh, but it will increase the rate of descent. So you can sure. last 10 metres or so and pop that in? Uh, at 20,000 feet, you can oh, pop wow. it. Yeah, quite, uh, quite uh, a fair bit of vibration throughout the airframe, but uh, could imagine. it also assists with getting us uh, on the ground. Yeah, nothing quite like uh, throwing out reverse thrust to suddenly come down. No, not at all. It's, uh, <laughs> you definitely want them retracted by about uh, three or 4,000 feet, so you're feeling comfortable. So uh, I understand there's a uh, maintenance ladder inside the tail that you can use to get right up. Have you been up there? There is, and no, I have not. Uh, it is on the bucket list, but I'm not sure I'll uh, get to achieve that one. I got to go on the, uh, the wings of a um, US one that was at Avalon one time, and there's a photo of me right out on the wingtip uh, up next to the wing wing. I'm jealous. I've only seen photos of our maintainers, but uh, nothing beyond that. Oh. I know now you've got to have all the hooks and, and working from height stuff. OHS. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it was about to say they don't like that. <laughs> you spilled my Chardonnay. <laughs> cool. So, uh, 21. At this stage, uh, instructional capability, so people look up from parts course and uh, I'm one of the people that gets to teach them how to fly. So, so they could go straight from a PC-21 to this? Absolutely. What do they do for multi-engine conversion? Uh, so we have an uh, in-house um, bridging course. Um, the the GS with the LSC around and uh, sweat wing and multi-engine aspects. Wow. Um, and then they go into the simulator for about four months uh, doing their training. That's pretty impressive. So PC-21 to this and, and one wonderful conversion course. Yeah, absolutely. So James simulating a tactical approach at the moment uh, and he'll uh, go around shortly. Um, and uh, demonstrate the uh, capability of the C-17 for attack arrival on the bus.
box set up for the inside diving smack roll.
play this aerobatic manoeuvre, he's going to start rolling round to the right. At the top of this vertical, Paul's going to transition into an upright flat spin. going to set up for his photo pass. He's going to put the aircraft down a low knife edge flight, giving a beautiful view of this beautiful yellow biplane known as the Wolf Pits Pro. Now there's only two of these aircraft in existence in the world and the one you see flying here today is serial number one. of service flying aircraft including the Hawk T1A and the uh, Tornado GR4. The aircraft has a speed of about 380 knots or uh, just kilometers range of about uh, the same and uh, does have the capability of carrying armament and that's uh, 230 as it's known uh, in New Zealand as his strike master basically exactly the same aircraft slightly higher rated engines was used for the Kiwis for many, many years, as well as a number of other overseas airports. In fact, most of the uh, Provost and Strike Masters around the world have now been purchased by civilian operators in the US for uh, the similar type training and ground attack training. So it's very hard to get parts, and I believe the guys who are having in New Zealand have had to just shut them down. Pretty much so. The, um it's interesting to see that the uh, Strike Masters and the uh, former Skyhawks from the RMZAF are both operating with that company. Uh, that would be Draken. Draken out of Florida. They, uh, they have the Mackies and the uh, A4s. In fact, the joke is you go to is wearing the training colours, the early training colours for the Royal Air Force, silver with achievements, including qualified flying instructor, air combat instructor and qualified tactics instructor on both Hawk and Tornado. So quite a distinguished career with the RAF over in the UK. He actually finished his RAF service as the chief examiner for the Tornado GR4 at their uh, central flying school. But these days he's uh, based in Tasmania and specialises in military, warbird and seaplane aviation. We'll be seeing him a little bit later on uh, in the Learjets that we see out the front of the crowd. 
and I believe also flying with Stephen Gale in the uh, S211s. Very simple aircraft, but very rugged and robust. Uh, to take the rigours of uh, training. As I said this took over from the piston engine provost as the, uh, the major training aircraft for the RAF and over 740 of these eventually manufactured. And uh, given its comparatively low cost of operations and good handling characteristics, it's uh, the Jet Provost is a very popular uh, lead in initial. adventure ride community here in Australia. Highly recommended if you've got the chance to uh, take advantage and go up in one of the warbirds and experience what it was like to uh, fly and form a military aircraft. But the majority of them were the 450 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R985. Now this aircraft looks very familiar to, or similar rather, to another aircraft of the time which was the uh, the Lockheed 10 and the Lockheed 12. Yeah, they're a little bit, um, a little bit smaller than uh, the Beach 18, but they were the contemporaries. And the reason that Beechcraft and the Beach 18 in particular took off was uh, Lockheed went on to other things. They were, with the outbreak of war, building the Hudson, then the Lodestar, uh, the P-38. They okay, were very busy indeed. Awesome. Also a similar configuration to the Cessna Bobcat, I believe it was the C-45? Yep. The, uh, the aircraft itself was quite interesting in that it was not built for a small aircraft like the B-17s, Mitchells, B-24s, etc. Well, this particular aircraft served with the Royal Canadian Air Force at up till 1968 when it was converted to a freighter and uh, during the 70s was a freighter but uh, wound up being confiscated by the US government in the 80s after it was involved in drug running doing the run from South America trying to stay low avoid anyone's observation and come in uh, it was of course impounded and eventually restored and, and I hear there's lots of people who like to restore old drug runners because they want to get all the panels off and have a look what might be inside that um, white powder might not necessarily be corrosion. That's the one. They're used for a variety of ops, of course, civilian uh, airliner, um, private transport, fire bombing, and uh, drug and weapons work. The CIA used uh, quite a few of them as well. And there were a number of conversions that were undertaken, particularly one by uh, a company called Volpar, where instead of a tail wheel, they had a nose wheel, lengthen the fuselage, put big viewing windows in the side, and um, a lot of those were actually used out in Hawaii for uh, inter-island tourism. There was one here in Australia operating with the Nolan nose wheel conversion. Uh, it was privileged to go flying the head of the Australian movie South Pacific, starring Harry Connick Jr. and Glenn Close. with the uh, US Navy till 1972 and the US Army was still operating them in 1976. So a very long and distinguished career. Quite a few of these went to the uh, Canadians, including this particular machine. Coming in pretty soon. So uh, I'll hand over here to Mike. Thanks very much, Ben. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Andy. Mike. And great to be here again for our home show. You look out uh, 10 o'clock high, the potential. Yes, well, that's a, a delicate point, but uh, I won't go too far into that. Here they come in now. Smoke is on. Jim Eaglin in the lead. Two yaks at uh, the back there doing a split rate for us. And Chang's over the top uh, with Jim Eaglin in the lead. Jim's a uh, 787 pilot for uh, Qantas, former 
F-18 pilot for the Air Force and uh, also flew in the Gulf War flying the uh, Tornado, one of the very few RAF pilots who had any combat experience from the time he was in. There's a heart uh, loop. Sean Trishow on the right, there you got Mar on the left. The Axe have moved uh, to the back of the uh, formation and uh, Al Pickering has been dedicated for Qantas. A darn nice guy. I'm only saying that because his mum and dad are here today, Merv and Gwen. Come up from Victoria to uh, Washington. Now to the right now, the three Nanchangs have reformed. Egon Mars now taking the lead. challenges for our wingmen to effect a rejoin on Egon. This is a point of pride for both of them, both being uh, except 18 pilots. And if you're anywhere near show centre, the uh, aircraft now coming around from one of our signature manoeuvres, the split brake, will be coming directly towards the uh, crowd and uh, to be very spectacular if you get it at the right time. to get beside him and pass uh, at show centre. It's uh, Jim Eagler from the left and Sean from the right. And checks down to Sparting uh, to uh, stage right. If you look uh, further right, Niall Higgins is uh, now demonstrating the inverted capabilities of the Yak-52. All these engines, all these aircraft are the same engines as the Russian uh, M14P, but only the Yaks have any sort of uh, sustained inverted capability due to a modification of the oil system. Now oh, they're performing uh, the dismount, and they'll turn the aircraft, come back towards uh, show centre. and uh, be performing a tight figure eight in front of the crowd. Now Pickering on the wing there doing his mum and dad proud.
doing this, the uh, Yaks are uh, positioning for their final maneuver. I'm seeing their tanks coming back, they'll complete a loop, turn their smoke off, pull up for a downward bomb burst, and the Yaks are aiming to be there right behind them for an upward bomb burst, being the uh, final maneuver out of display. Ground now with the downward bumpers. And with the X uh, now complete their bombers finish. Start of our warbirds uh, for this afternoon. The uh, two Mustangs. Paul Bennett's back behind the uh, controls. He's leading the first Mustang, flying that one. The uh, first aircraft has come down from Scone as part of the collection uh, put together by Cole uh, and Ross Pay. Unfortunately, Cole is no longer with us, but uh, that collection run by Ross and he's very kindly allowed that aircraft to come down. Second aircraft has come down from Caboolture. Uh, we'll talk about uh, them individually when they uh, do their displays. Mate, I've just been arrived at uh, the RAAF's demo team, the uh, roulettes, the four pilots who are here, are going to be uh, doing a uh, lap of honour in a pair of BMWs shortly. And they'll also be uh, signing V12 Merlin engines. States to actually manufacture the Mustang. We built 200 of them down at uh, the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation factory at Fisherman's Bend in Victoria, Melbourne, right next to the Yarra River. Yeah, where there's a bunch of uh, light commercial factories and so on, and a dirty great bridge these days. Right next to the West Gate. That's the one. In fact, that's where the uh, Government's Defence uh, Maritime and Aviation Research Lab is. Ando, the sound and the distance of the two Merlins, it's what some people in Europe would have heard just before a, uh, an attack rolling it. Certainly this was the uh, fighter that brought the, the war to the heart of Germany. They could uh, travel with the bombers, hence the uh, nickname that they had, the fighter with the seven league boots. But it was incredible to think that we would not be looking at this if it wasn't for the British, because uh, they went to the United States to get North American aviation to actually build um, P-40s. But Dutch Kindleberger said, we can build you a better aeroplane with the same engine in the same time it would take to tool up. So uh, the British ordered the aircraft, and um, it was 
pretty conventional design at the time, apart from two things. This partial. And another highly successful strafing run by the Mustangs, which is certainly uh, one of the things that the aircraft were doing towards the latter parts of the war. They'd escort the bombers to Berlin and five bouncers as they'd come over the, the coast to get them to drop their uh, uh, underwing fuel tanks and uh, so they could engage in the combat because they couldn't dogfight very well with those tanks on. And of course, once they dropped them, they couldn't get to Berlin. caliber machine guns. It could carry uh, 10 air-to-ground rockets or up to a thousand pound bomb on each wing. Beautiful sound there. Coming in from the right again now. Listen to that sound. Now this time, that Mustang is the uh, is the pay Mustang, as we just talked about. Yeah, it was uh, flown for many years by a guy called uh, Aubrey, or as he liked to be called, Titus Oates. He owned the Royal Hotel up at Bathurst, amongst other things. This aircraft flew in a brilliant red scheme with uh, white registration. Aramine. I do believe a lot of the fuel from the um, Qantas constellations that were bunkered up there went into the Mustang. <laughs> we'll just divert this for a sec. That aircraft is still actually flying in the United States to this day. This, the colour scheme that you see on the aircraft now is the exact colour scheme that it wore um, at the East Sale. Quite a few of those uh, aircraft are still on the circuit. 05 is uh, Bob Eastgate's aircraft. Lovely displays today of both aircraft by First Met Hall. An illustration of what these aircraft are capable of. Yeah, that uh, Caboolture one. Right. We uh, have another aircraft uh, that's come down from Skane. We'll be seeing uh, a little bit later on one of its kind in Australia, and uh, the other. Interesting, interesting life for this aircraft, given it was sold for scrap in 1957, and then wound up in the USA in 19... The Blue Spinner, 
was uh, the marking applied to number 82 squadron. 77 squadron had a white spinner allocated to it. So as I said, part of the British Commonwealth Occupation Forces. The RAAF did... That's part of the syndicate that owns this aircraft. And uh, really puts on a beautiful display. Of course, that aircraft is available up in Caboolture for Warbird Adventure Rides. Highly recommend. Both tandem, two seat. They're both with uh, virtually the same engine. Both the aircraft types are inexorably linked. there from that uh, plan view of the aircraft. The wings look virtually identical in plan form. And now splitting for their uh, individual displays. Tim Dugan will be first on the uh, T6. And uh, beautiful to see these two aircraft with similar heritage flying together. similarities between these two is because they both had the same forebear, an aircraft called the NA-16. It's built by North American Aviation. North American Aviation responsible for uh, quite a few very famous aircraft. They actually started off as a holding company in the United States for Airlines in 1928. They didn't get into building aircraft until 1934. Uh, one of their very first products was the NA-16. It could be fitted with a number of different engines and a fixed or retractable undercarriage, but it drew a very, very sound basis. The uh, US Army Air Two. Eventually the uh, Harvard, but in between, it was a uh, basic trainer, BT-13. BT-13, yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. Yeah, a fixed undercarriage, 450 horsepower engine. And that's also linked to the T-6 that we see here because uh, they had a higher powered version of the BT-13 that went into competition with this machine to become the advanced trainer for the US Army Air Corps. So the BT-13 was built by Volte, wasn't it? Volte, that's correct. And I believe it had a rather amusing uh, name given to it by the pilots. Yep, the vibrator. Because when it got near Sydney together with Ken Allport at, um, in Sydney, not too far from my place. Wow. That could be great. We could hit, see a stair in a Volte BT-13 and a Harvard and we're away all in formation. What you're seeing here is a very much improved version of the, uh, the first now, This particular aircraft 
is different from the uh, the NA16 or the, the Harvard, whereas in uh, the first aircraft that came out, which is known as the Harvard one, to, uh, to the Brits, to the Commonwealth countries, it was all fabric size. Folks, just a reminder, with this wind, you may have uh, somebody see any of that on the ground, please do pick it up and put it in the trash because uh, we don't want that turning into uh, debris or fog and getting uh, blown over into aircraft and uh, go up intakes and so on. There are over 15,000 of these, nearly 15,500 of these uh, produced, known as the SNJ to the US Navy and uh, it was used by over 60 different air arms. Being flown today by Tim Dugan once again, who's from Wilton in New South Wales. He's got about 8,000 hours of uh, pilot command time. He's been doing aerobatics for about 15 years. The aircraft could be fitted with uh, single machine gun firing through the propeller arc or uh, some of the other versions. They could carry bombs, underwing rubber of them were actually on operations in the very early days of the war. 18 of them had been sent up to Singapore to help train pilots and convert them over to the Brewster Buffalo fighter, which in itself was obsolete. They also equipped uh, number 24 squadron that was up at Rabaul when the Japanese swept across the Pacific. And a training aircraft with light 303 machine guns was absolutely no match for the uh, heavily armed Japanese fighters. Yeah, those uh, Zeros and Zeeks and so on were a lot more manoeuvrable than these aircraft and uh, pretty much blew them all out of the sky. But uh, one, we're away, a very famous one, which I believe is at the uh, Memorial, War Memorial in Canberra, actually managed to shoot uh, down a Zeke. Yep. The, uh, one of the four squadron aircraft, we had four squadron based in New Guinea, five squadron in the Solomons. It was flying near what they call the Gona Wreck, uh, a wreck Japanese ship, and a Japanese fighter flew underneath it. The guy that was flying it, John Archer, pushed the Wirraway's nose down and in one firing pass on the way through, managed to shoot down the uh, Japanese aircraft. When he landed back at uh, his base, the observer in the back actually jumped out of the aircraft before the aircraft had stopped moving. So they, the people on the ground thought that Archer had been wounded. But when they found out what happened, they sent a very famous signal back to their headquarters and it read, Archer has shot down one Zeke, repeat, one Zeke, send six bottles beer. They must have been pretty frugal if they only wanted six. Not too much allowed up in the uh, <laughs> combat area in those days. But that aircraft, as you said, still exists on display in the Australian War Memorial. This aircraft is uh, painted up in the markings of a machine that was flown by number four squadron. And this aircraft was completely rebuilt uh, to airworthy condition uh, by Sandor Aviation up in, uh, uh, in May 1943 after out of fuel when the pilot became, as we say, uncertain of position. Lost. No, we don't say that. The one big difference between this and the uh, T6 or the Harvard we saw flying earlier on is that there is no washout. And what that means is the angle of the wing doesn't change as you go out from the wing root to the wing tip. And this is very important that that change takes place because if it is not there, the wing does not stall evenly and in low and slow configuration, the aircraft can actually flip on its back and uh, not very good because low and slow generally means when you're in the circuit to land. That's the one. That's the, when you've got no altitude to recover from that kind of situation. So that was uh, the reason why uh, a lot of people were killed during the war on the training. But it is a much more difficult to aer aeroplane to fly the Wirraway than the Harvard. So it is easier to step from a Wirraway into aircraft like the P-40, Mustang and Spitfire. 
all this aircraft today, as we said earlier, being flown by Ben Lappin. He's from uh, Gippsland in Victoria, but these days lives in Melbourne. He's got over 6,000 hours of total. The Learjet, of course, synonymous with uh, best jet flying. And uh, we arrived from the Swiss uh, ground attack aircraft, live to Lear, and first flew in October 1963. Hayden, welcome to commentary. How long have you been with air affairs? Hi. Diving in. So everybody here at Wings Avenue Laura, we'd like to uh, thank you for having us here and uh, on display right now coming in from north is the Air Affairs Learjet Formation. The aircraft is uh, peeled off heading to the south now. They'll be doing a right hand turn and coming back for the belly side pass. Once, yeah. Go ahead. Once again, you know that it's a bit of a unique thing to see two Lear jets like this when uh, everyone up here on the tower is busy taking photos as they go past. Yeah, it's not the, uh, not the norm that uh, sort of gets to happen, but we love to be able to do it when we can. It's um, fantastic to show off the wonderful capability that they have. From 97 to 99, and he's awarded the MBE for leadership in Air Ops in 1998. He's been a tactical Learjet captain since 2016. Tasmanian Warbird Adventure Flights. He's a tactical Learjet captain at Air Affairs and also display pilot in the Provost and the 211 as we saw before. And he's over got 7,500 hours experience in flying fast jets. So he's quite a talented pilot. The aircraft are just uh, repositioning to the west of the airfield. Lovely. That's number one exit to the south and number two exits to the north. The army in Italy. Served in Iraq, Libya and Afghanistan. He's been at Air Affairs since 2017 and he is a tactical Learjet captain. This is how we like to come in and enter the circuit most of the time. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having us here at Wings Over the Elwara for the Learjet fan break. Not your usual bizjet biz approach to the circuit, is it? No, no, when they're uh, doing 60 degree angle of bank um, straight over the runway at 150 feet, it's a bit different to what you're doing. The Hurricane is a much more bulky aeroplane with a slip off. Uh, but both designed to take advantage of what was known then as the PV-12. Rolls-Royce Private Venture 12 that became the Merlin. It's definitely a uh, more solid, stocky construction. I believe it uh, could take a lot more punishment than a Spitfire could. Spitfire is a completely different type of construction. Um, it is a monocoque structure. The wing on the Spitfire is immensely strong. It's uh, formed from a torsion box, the leading edge. Uh, it's a very thick um, skin on the front of it. It actually has a higher limiting Mach number than the Meteor Jet Fighter, whereas the Hurricane is a totally different type of construction. Hurricane relies on uh, tube fuselage. It's not a welded steel tube fuselage, but it's very complex. It's exactly the same type of construction that was used in the Hawker biplane fight. Even the wings in the early Mark I Hurricanes were actually fabric covered. And although the uh, Spitfire got the, all the recognition for the Battle of Britain, it, I believe it was the uh, Hurricane that did more of the work. Hurricane actually shot down uh, more Luftwaffe aircraft. Uh, Prince uh, used the Spider aircraft, Spider versus the Spider. You can see Scotty's just going to bring the Spitfire back in now. One pass in by Scotty. Paul's just uh, to the east, climbing. 
there you see that beautiful elliptical wing platform that was the instant recognition feature for the Spitfire through all the marks up to uh, the 20s where they went into a different laminar flow type wing. Yeah, that was where they squared off the wingtips. And didn't they do that for a couple of the post manufacturer? It was a subsequent mod. Uh, the uh, the final thirteen and a half thousand of these built by Walker in the UK, and a further fourteen hundred of them built by the Canadian Car and Foundry in Canada. But this is one of those Canadian built examples. First flew in nineteen thirty five and it was uh, produced from 37 to 44. I believe this uh, particular aircraft was first built in 1942 in Canada. It, it's a, a Mark 12, equivalent to a Mark II. And this uh, aircraft is painted in the markings of an Australian guy who was uh, in the RAF and was killed during the, um, the Battle of Britain, a guy called John Dallas Crossman. He uh, was born in North Queensland and grew up in Newcastle. John Brooks, who owns the aircraft, uh, of course, based up at Scone in the Upper Hunter, uh, he wanted to pay tribute to uh, Crossman. September 1940 was his first operational mission against the Luftwaffe and uh, that was against 60 plus Messerschmitt 109s. He fired at one but couldn't see any results. And uh, on the 15th of September, he noted in one of the missions there were hundreds of Jerry Kites, 19,000 feet. He'd flown 18 sorties by the 30th of September and on that fateful day, uh, they got involved with a group of 109s. And it is said that witnesses claimed he engaged over 20 109s by himself, displaying exceptional courage, but unfortunately he was shot down and killed. Quite the, quite the experience, and uh, while Paul continues... about half a caribou. That engine on the fighter is typically found on the caribou we saw earlier today. Hurricanes used in uh, every combat theatre, China, Burma, India. Not used by Australia. We had one example out here, but it, uh, there were no orders for the hurricane. It was used uh, in Russia, North Africa, the Mediterranean. Some of the variants carried 37 millimeter cannons under the wings for tank busting. And of course there was the Sea Hurricane. Some of these aircraft were actually launched off converted merchant ships to uh, protect the convoys from the predations of the Fock Wolf Condor, the four-engined uh, bomber operated by the Luftwaffe. These but ships had something like a, a bridge girder structure on the deck and uh, the hurricane but then he had to either parachute out or land in the water next to the ship and be picked up that was exactly the question i was going on so the x just taxiing in once james is out of the way i believe uh we'll see what uh, uh coming in from the right smoking fastest man in australian motorsport apparently <laughs> well, he's having a lot of fun up there, isn't he, Bob? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was such a nice aeroplane to fly. It's just a delight to display as well. Uh, he's just put that smoke modification into the aeroplane, which uh, you know, gives it a good highlight as it comes past. It certainly does. Mark is uh, probably the most experienced L-39 pilot in Australia. Well, he uh, used to race at Reno in an L-39. 
Yes, he did. Uh, he was quite successful uh, with it. He never won one, but he uh, always came second or third. And uh, it's a very difficult qualification to attain. They're very strict uh, with who they allow to uh, actually race the aircraft. So, yeah, he's done very well over there. Yeah, he's gone, gone through. You've got a lot of training to go through to even be allowed in as a rookie. Yeah. And he, he won best, best rookie on his first year. Yeah, he did. And um, the thing about it that uh, they were worried about him was he was the first civilian jet pilot that they'd ever had to deal with. And uh, he's, you know, impressed them very much with his abilities. He's done very well. Yeah, no military background. They were a bit surprised about that. Yeah. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Reno Air Races, it's, it's like the American NASCAR racing. You go fast, turn left, but you're doing it about 500 miles an hour in jets or piston engine aircraft at about 50 feet off the desert. Quite spectacular. Scary stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, imagine six aircraft like this, 50 feet off the ground, all 500 to, miles. All trying to beat each other into a corner. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we, why we say Mark's the... Uh, fastest Australian in motorsport because yeah. he actually goes faster than the F1 drivers. Yeah, exactly right. Nice four point presentation roll. And the old 39s, it's an incredible aircraft when you're sitting in the back as, as a passenger. You've really got some great visibility. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, very smooth ride. And, of course, this aircraft is available through uh, jet ride to That's right, go yeah. for uh, adventure flights. Yeah, both Mark and I uh, share the, the jet ride uh, adventure flights. It's, uh, it's a good day, actually, uh, in the Hunter Valley. A lot of people come up to the Hunter Valley and spend the weekend and do a jet flight and uh, yeah, go from there. Yeah, go for the jet flight in the morning and then the wineries in the afternoon. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I go up every year to, for the long weekend. There's a bunch of us get together with hot air balloons. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful part of the part of the world. It looks great from the air. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely up there. And of course, you guys will uh, tailor the adventure to suit the person if they just want to say they've hit a ride in the jet. Off the yeah. corner. Yeah. <laughs> But it's all positive G, and yeah. doesn't, doesn't like to do negatives. No, that tends to uh, bring people undone if you start doing too much negative G. Yeah. Although we do see some the negative G and inverted passes here. Yeah, that's right. When you're doing it by yourself, it's not so bad. Just pulling up into a barrel roll there. Lovely. So, for all, are you able to tell us, like, when we're flying the jet, have you had any... Uh, distinguished or interesting passengers? Uh, Mark's had uh, quite a few. Uh, just recently, uh, they were on Channel 9, uh, flew one of the ladies from there, but uh, yeah, we've had uh, Ian Doe. Uh, he came along once and uh, they, he said, no. He Not Ian Doe. <laughs> no, Ian Doe. And uh, he said, you need to make me sick. Well, that was easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I could imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I think it was at an arm with display. Yeah. <laughs> of course, some of these aircraft are actually out, still outfitted with hard points. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. It's uh, capable of uh, carrying rockets, bombs, and uh, it also has a gun pod that can be fitted in just behind the nose wheel on the uh, center line. Interesting spot for it, just behind the nose wheel. Yeah, you got to make sure the gear's up before you start those. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's and as right. I just said, he'll talk to Mark. <laughs> Mark. Mark will come up and uh, critically. <laughs>
Right, mate, and uh, those of you with uh, sharp eyes would have noticed that unlike a Virgin or a Quartus 737, the uh, Poseidon doesn't have the winglets that point upwards, it's got the ranked wingtips that you'll find on the 777. So they, they, were, they were put on it for best performance at low altitude as opposed to high altitude crews that the winglets are designed for. And the wing has been considerably strengthened for that uh, low altitude work. You'll notice uh, that the Orion had a, a mad boom or a magnetic anomaly detector boom. This uh, aircraft is not fitted with that, but it's fitted with a variety of different sensors and can even sniff out diesel exhaust fumes from conventionally powered submarines. That's right, mate. The uh, hydrocarbon sniffer on board. Have a look there. You can see the bomb bay doors open there under the fuselage behind the wing. Aircraft uh, has five internal and six external stations. It can carry uh, different types of missiles, the uh, harpoon, the radar. Now this uh, surface search radar adds additional target track capability. It's got colour weather avoidance mode and there's a lot of room for technological improvements in that radar as uh, the years go by. Continuing a, um, a maritime theme that's been going on with the RAAF for many, many years, starting actually with the Avro Anson, right the way back in those days. It's operated by the, uh, the Indians, Australians, obviously the US Navy. The, um, the Kiwis have just uh, placed orders for some as well. They have, I think, about four for them to replace their P3Bs. Oh, sorry, P3K2s. They have uh, one of the biggest patrol areas in the world. All the way down to Antarctica, and that was a major part of 
this aircraft had to be able to handle hard compression and hard Operated by numbers uh, 10 and 11 squadrons and number 92 wing based at Edinburgh in South Australia, just north of Adelaide. The uh, UK have also recently just ordered this and will be operated as the Poseidon MRA-1 and apparently the Royal Norwegian Air Force. They've, um, they'll be operating in conjunction with the new order, um, like the, um, the bigger brother, shall we say, of the Global Hawk, which yes. we saw down at Avalon, and for the first time ever in the world, they flew a, a Global Hawk into Avalon, and the guys who were flying it were based in the United States. That's right, it was the first time an unmanned aerial system had actually landed at an active air show. Anywhere in the world, yeah. Well, they so did actually, they did fly it into a few years into Avalon, but it came in when no one was there and it was parked on display, but this is the first time it landed as part of the air display on the Friday. The, uh, the Triton, of course, is the marinized version of the, uh, the other one, and uh, designed to be able to fly out of Edinburgh, we'll be flying it out of Edinburgh, designed to fly at very high altitude, all come down, massive electro-optical sensor suite, and uh, designed to loiter and uh, watch out all the borders Certainly this 737 has been the uh, basis of uh, quite a few Jet technology improved. They fitted the 481 horsepower engine, the 9-cylinder radio. It's got that Harley Davidson on steroids sound because the uh, the stacks are basically one per cylinder. So if you figure it out, it is a, this is a V model. This is a, this is the first model to be fitted with that larger. Basically the same engine that's in the Grumman Tracker. The C model was uh, for carrier qualifications and fitted with a tail hook. You can tell a, a C model because the, um, the bottom of the fuselage is actually notched uh, right under the rudder. And then they had a dedicated attack aircraft, the T-28D. Singapore Air Force by the uh, Philippines and also by Haiti. 